All right, let's go to our Bible lesson. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 7. Again. Hebrews, chapter 7. We looked at only the first three verses last week, verses 1, 2, and 3, and we considered Melchizedek, the priest of Salem, uh, the priest of, uh, meaning uh, king of peace, king of righteousness. His name means king of righteousness, as verse 2 tells us. But there's not a lot of information about him in the scriptures. He's kind of a mystery character. We don't know how he became a priest of God. We don't know when he became a priest of God, when he stopped being a priest of God, if he did. And it's popular for a lot of people to guess that Melchizedek was a, an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus, sort of a, an early appearance of Christ in the scriptures, kind of like a preview of coming attractions at the movie theater, only, only Jesus appearing in some physical form for a brief time in the Old Testament. Kind of like in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, in the, Hebrew, the three Hebrews are put in the fiery furnace, and King Nebuchadnezzar looks through a, a window into the furnace, and he says, I see four men loosed and walking about, and they have no hurt. And behold, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So we believe that was the Lord Jesus appearing in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrews to uh, comfort them. In their time of trouble. The amazing thing is, when they came out of the fiery furnace, they weren't burned. Their clothes weren't burned, and the Bible says there was no even not even the smell of fire was on them. About um, twenty years ago, you couldn't hardly go to a restaurant without the smell of somebody else's cigarette smoke getting on you, and you. You know, you're there for five minutes, and then you walk out stinking for the rest of the day. But they didn't even smell like they had been in the fire when they came out, because the Lord Jesus was with them. But Melchizedek, I don't believe, was the Lord Jesus appearing early. Um, verse 3 says, He was made like unto the Son of God, in respect to um, being a priest or having a priesthood. So he wasn't the Son of God, but he was very much like the Son of God. Uh, it couldn't be that uh, Christ, as far as not having a mother, because the, the description said having neither father nor mother. Well, Jesus had a mother on this earth. He certainly had a father in heaven. And it couldn't be the angel of the Lord that appears a number of times in the scriptures, because if he was the angel of the Lord, it also said there in verse uh, 3, he would be an angel who abideth a priest continually. I don't know of any priest, or rather any angel, that's also a priest on behalf of God's people. Um, it's possible, I'm going to throw this out to you today, it's possible that he could have been Noah's middle son, Shem. God said in Genesis 9, verse 26, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. A couple of problems with that theory, um, because it says, having uh, neither beginning of days nor, nor descent. Well, obviously Shem had a father, Noah, and a mother, as uh, we assume Melchizedek did, but, but it said he didn't. And uh, if he didn't have any descent, there was no descendants after him, then none of you Koreans would be here today. Because Shem was the father of the Asian Oriental races of people. So it, it, it couldn't mean that, but it, it still may be Shem, and I'll get to that in just a minute. God said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. He didn't say the same thing about Japheth, the father of us white people. He didn't say the same thing about Ham, the father of the uh, African nations. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And uh, I have a book at home that I picked up through my job called The Psychology of Funeral Service. And it was written back in the 50s. And the, the uh, 
mortuary professor who wrote the book also talked about the religious attitudes of different people. And he says, all religions seem to come from the Asiatics, Oriental religions. Uh, white people are called Occidentals. I never have liked that term, Occidental. Almost, it's too close to ac accidental. It's not too much like accidental. But uh, technically, that's the term you, you designate white people as Occidentals, um, Asian people as Orientals. Um, I don't know if there's a third corresponding term for Africans or not, but uh, you can just leave Melchizedek as he is. It's just a mystery in the Bible and not say anything more about it. But since the book of Hebrews uh, gives several verses describing him, then it's worth some further consideration. The best guess might be that Melchizedek was another name for Shem, and I'm going to explain why. Shem would have still been alive when Abraham met him. Shem lived to be 600 years old, according to Genesis 11, verses 10 and 11. Um, Abraham would not have been out of line in giving him tithes of his possessions, his spoils of war. Um, Shem would have been the chief reigning patriarch of all the uh, Shemitic peoples, the Asian peoples of the world at that time, of which Abraham was one. Um, in fact, the word Hebrew comes from one of Shem's sons, Eber, mentioned in Genesis 10, verse 24. Uh, I was listening to the radio the other day, and at Calvary Chapel will have that radio call-in show, Pastor's Perspective. Somebody called in and asked these two Calvary Chapel ministers uh, where the word Hebrews came from, Hebrew. Just about every authority says it came from the name of Eber, one of Shem's sons. But these two guys had no idea where the name came from. It's not that difficult to find the answer. I mean, you Google it, Wikipedia would probably tell you what, what it was. It undoubtedly came from the name Eber, one of Shem's sons. But, um, so Abraham wouldn't have been out of line uh, giving him tithes, what he possessed. And Shem would have been the reigning head of all the Asian peoples at the time of Abraham's encounter. Uh, Shem's father Noah was the priest of his family, according to Genesis uh, uh, 9, or Genesis 8, rather, verse 20. So there's no reason Shem wouldn't have been the top reigning spiritual head of all the Asiatic peoples in the world at the time. I don't know how many people were in the world at the time Abraham met him. You know that the atheists insist that um, man has been here for millions of years. The evolutionists say God and man has been here millions of years. And uh, reproducing and uh, fighting to survive and fighting, struggling to survive against nature, against disasters, against germs and warfare and so forth, things that he couldn't have imagined. And if you ever encounter someone who says there is no God, if you ever have a chance to talk to someone who says, I believe in evolution, I don't believe in your God, I don't believe in your Bible, then ask him this question. This is the question you want to ask him. If mankind has been here on the earth reproducing at some steady rate for, let's just say, 500,000 years, where did everybody go? Right now, there's about seven and a half billion people in the whole world. And you can get on the internet, type in world population, world census information, and you'll find a chart, a graph, that curves backwards in time. In, it's about seven and a half billion people in the world now. In 1980, there were only three and a half billion people in the world. In 1950, they estimate only two and a half billion people in the world. In 1870, one and a half billion billion people in the entire world. And at the time of Jesus, they estimate, and this is from about 11 different sources, um, they estimate only about 400 million people 
were in the entire world at the time of Christ. So you can't trace the population growth back any farther than around the time of Noah. God started the world all over again with Noah's family of eight people. And so three, four hundred years later, when Abraham runs into Shem, how many people were in the world at the time? I don't know. But it's a safe bet. It wasn't seven and a half billion, right? <laughs> so ask someone, where did everyone go? If man has been reproducing for 500,000 years, or even 100,000 years, we ought to have 50 people per square foot on the earth. 50 people fighting for every square foot of space just to stand. But we don't. The world's a big place, and there's still a lot of room for people to live. Actually, <clears throat> Kent Hovind made this uh, point, and I'm going to use the city of Ontario as an example. If you were to knock down every house here in the city of Ontario, every tree, every light pole, every obstacle, so that the entire city was just perfectly flat, like the airport runway, there were no, there's no obstacles, no obstructions. You could fit the entire world's population into the city limits of Ontario. They'd be standing close to each other, seven and a half, but you could do it. And so the world is not overcrowded. If It would be overcrowded if evolution was true and people have been reproducing for millions of years. Or the atheists are right, and there is no God, and so the, if there's no, no God of Noah, then there was no flood of Noah. So how do you explain the fact that we only have seven and a half billion people now rather than 700 billion people, which we probably should have. <clears throat> so Shem's father, Noah, was the head of his people. It uh, stands to reason that Shem could have been the head of all the uh, Shemitic peoples at the time as well. If you say that Melchizedek was actually Shem, but the best thing you can do is say that the biblical record, at least the scriptures, don't go into detail about his descendants. At least, not as far as Melchizedek goes, but as far as concerning the priesthood. The Bible tells us about Shem's descendants. The Bible tells, obviously he had a father, Noah. He had a wife. Uh, he had children. His children's names are listed in the book of Genesis. So, not in that sense, but in the sense of him being connected to a priesthood in some way, or his father and mother being connected to a priesthood, or his descendants being connected to a priesthood. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. That's about the best thing you could say if you, if you suggest that Melchizedek was actually Shem. But Melchizedek is a mystery person in the Word of God. Notice he was called priest of the Most High God in verse 1. And that term is consistently used as a Gentile term for God throughout the scriptures. You see, before God, before God singled out Abraham out of the Shemites and started and began the, the nation of the Jew, the race of Israel, the Jews, everybody was a Gentile. You Shemites, you Koreans who are not Jews, you're Gentiles too. Everybody was a Gentile before God chose Abraham and selected his family to bless. Uh, and so in that sense, Shem was a, a Gentile. By the way, um, I wasn't thinking of saying this, but in the scriptures, and you can find the verses and connect them together, Gentile, another word for Gentile is heathen in the scriptures. Find the word heathen, H-E-A-T-H-E-N, heathen. That means a barbaric, pagan, godless, un unbelieving, um, you know, savage. That's the heathen. That's basically how everybody else is without Jesus Christ. <laughs> You're a savage in some way. And, um, but what it says of Japheth, it begins with Japheth, begins with white folks, wouldn't you know? Begins with white folks in Genesis 10, and it says of Japheth, um, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their day. So Japheth, after the flood, after the, the uh, sons of Noah were divided and went different directions, Japheth went westward and undoubtedly 
populated all of the European nations, the European Isles, the Greek Isles, and so forth. Um, so by these were all the, the nations of the Gentiles divided. So the word Gentile and heathen begins with white people. I wish I could change it, but I like it. I can't change it. <laughs> but it's, it's nevertheless true, and yet everybody was a Gentile before God separated Abraham. Uh, but Melchizedek, who was still a Gentile, says, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, Genesis 14, verse 19. And then right after that, Abraham tells the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, Genesis 14, verse 22. But from there on, the Jews would refer to the God of Abraham, our father, or the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Abraham, uh, or the God of Abraham, and so forth. They would identify God with their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their faith. There, uh, and they, you can find that phrase, the God of Abraham, in some form, or the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, in some form about 45 times throughout the scriptures. Um, the, there has never been not even five or six nations or groups of people in the world who, who don't believe in one supreme God, one most high God. Even countries that have um, pantheism, or not pantheism, poly, polytheistic, where they worship many gods. <clears throat> Hinduism, what is Hinduism in, in Korean? It's uh, Hindu Kyo, Hindu Kyo. But Hindus, I was reading an article early this morning in preparation for this. Hindus have 33 million gods and goddesses. That's a lot of names to remember. That's a lot of... They have a God that controls everything. Um, but of those 33 million deities, they have one primary all-powerful deity named Krishna. Krishna is the supreme God of everything. And Krishna created other gods to do certain jobs. Krishna created Brahma. He created the physical universe. And then other gods, Vishnu and Shiva, they're in charge of destroying the universe one day. They, Krishna created another god to control education and wisdom and so forth, all these different elements of, of creation. And uh, each one of them has responsibilities, under, uh, people with responsibilities underneath them. So there's this multitude of, multitude is an understatement. 33 million <laughs> is, a, is more accurate. 33 million deities that Hindus worship. And they, they say it's like a corporation where there's one CEO, but he has a whole bunch of, of his executive vice presidents, and they have department managers under them, and then they have sub-managers under them, and then they have all the working class underneath them. That's how they try to, to sell it. But for us who have good judgment, we know it's a lot of nonsense. It's like a comic book, really. That's why, that's why Marvel Comics and DC Comics and superheroes are so popular right now. Because when there was a great uh, thinker named G.K. Chesterton, and he said, when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing, they believe in anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people stop believing in the Lord God of the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ, they're willing to believe anything, such as a, a fairy tale like evolution. Somehow, the complexity, the details of every living organism, every cell in your body, every, every atom in the universe, all kind of came together by accident, all by itself. That goes contrary to any kind of common sense a person would have. Everything else in life is planned and organized and ordered and made to happen in some, by some means. But to think that the most complex and... Uh, intricate thing around us happened all by itself, it, you have to be an idiot right. to believe that. But there are a lot of idiots in the world. <laughs> and so, but there's never been a, a nation of people who didn't have at least one belief in one 
ultimate supreme deity, supreme God, even countries that have millions of gods. And we haven't gone any farther yet in Hebrews 7, so I want to do that. Let's continue. Look at verses uh, 4 through 7. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. In other words, the Levites and the priesthood they receive tithes and, and offerings from the other tribes to support them. Um, but they all came from Abraham, so Abraham was very important. Now, if Abraham paid his tithes to someone else, then that first priest was greater than the Levites who would come later in, in descending order. That person was even greater than Abraham. Um, look at verses 8, 9, and 10. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is written that he liveth. And as I, um, and as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Here, Verse, the word here, in verse 8, that's a reference to the Levite priesthood still existing when Paul wrote this book. And I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. The book of, actually, it doesn't say that Paul was the author, but the King James translators figured it out. Look at the title uh, before chapter 1. It says the, the uh, epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. The King James translators are the ones that wrote that in there. But you compare what is written here and matches everything else Paul wrote. But... The word here is a reference to the Levite priesthood that still existed when Paul wrote this book. He says, men that die receive tithes. And then, but there, later in the verse, but there, that will refer to Melchizedek and the specific quotation given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, down there in verse 17. You can jump ahead and look at that verse. I want to point out an important distinction in the language. About a year ago, it occurred to me that my English was poor. I didn't think I spoke very well. I was telling one of our Korean sisters this last week. And uh, I'm not afraid to get up in public and speak or sing a song, or tell a joke, but, but I didn't think I spoke very well. And so I decided I'm going to try to improve my knowledge of English, my ability to speak in public, and I'm still learning, I'm still struggling with it. But I want to point out a very important distinction in the English language here. Verse 17 says, About Christ, thou art a priest forever. He has an endless life, according to verse 16, just before that. And then earlier in chapter 6, verse 20, it also said there, Christ is an high priest forever. And then earlier in chapter 5, verse 6, it said, Thou art a priest forever, quoting from Psalm 110 and verse 4. But of Melchizedek, Chapter 7, verse 3, it says, He was made like unto the Son of God, and that he abideth a priest continually. Now, the words continual and continuous are not synonyms with each other. They don't mean exactly the same thing. They're used interchangeably by a lot of people who aren't aware of it, 
but they're not perfect matches with each other. There's a slight distinction between the two words. Continual means something happening over and over and over and over again at little intervals of time. It stops, it starts, it stops, it starts. Like the telephone was ringing continually at, at the office all day, right? About every five minutes, another phone call. But if the, if the ringer kept going and never stopped, it just was kept ringing, that would be continuous. Well, it would not maybe stop. And continuous is more closely related to the words forever, without an end, uh, without stopping. So you see the difference between Melchizedek's priesthood. It had to come to an end at some point. A difference between Melchizedek's priesthood and Christ's priesthood. His will last forever without any end, without any stop, without any, without any break. Where Melchizedek offered sacrifices over and over and over again as necessary, as the need required. So whoever Melchizedek was, his priesthood came to an end eventually, but he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't Jesus Christ, but he was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ whose, whose priesthood has no end. Christ's priesthood will never end. It will never stop. He will always be our mediator. He will always be the one whose death uh, was sufficient to cover all of our sins forever. And I've explained this before, but let me give it to you once again. In the Old Testament scriptures under the, under the law of Moses and the Jews, God commanded them to offer sacrifices when they sinned. And you can read about the different kinds of sacrifices, the different types of animals, and how, with, how they were to be slaughtered, how they were to be offered on the altar throughout the book of Leviticus. But when, when they sinned, they were to bring an animal and offer, have the priest offer it on their behalf. But the next time they sinned and they were guilty of it, they were to bring another animal and do it again. It would forgive their sin. It would, uh, uh, from that, from that, it would forgive that sin at the, point, at the moment. But it wouldn't cleanse them perfectly forever. It had to be repeated. However, what, what man needed was a sacrifice that would be able to cover his sins forever, so it wouldn't have to be repeated again. That is the Lord Jesus Christ's death. The Lord Jesus Christ was not only, uh, the animals were not as valuable as man. Man was given dominion over the animals in Genesis 1. <clears throat> so what man needed was a sacrifice that was equal to him in value, and even greater than him in value so that the death of that sacrifice would be sufficient to cover his sin forever. Amen. And the, the marvelous thing is Christ's death on the cross 2,000 years ago is still able to cover the sins of someone who is born today. Amen. And in a few years realizes he's a sinner or she's a sinner and is able to trust in that death and it'll cover their sins as well. It'll cover the sins of anyone that trusts God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ's sacrifice was greater than any sacrifice Melchizedek made. And so he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And there were a number of text I was going to run you to. We've got a little bit of time. I jumped over it, but I'm going to go back to it. Um, it has to do with the term the Most High God. I said that's a sort of a Gentile designation for God throughout the scriptures. Go, if you will, um, to the book of Deuteronomy. I'll just have you go from verse to verse quickly, and we won't dwell on each one. Go to the book of Deuteronomy. <coughs> 32, Deuteronomy chapter 32, and one verse there, verse 8, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And um, I've heard it said that there are 
someone identified 12 distinct geographic uh, boundaries in the world, like North America, Central America, South America, the European Isles, the African continent, areas throughout uh, the Far East and China and so on. 12 natural geographic boundaries where people have been uh, centered or centralized and then spread out from those places. And I don't know if that has any connection to this verse at all, but the Jew is going to rule over the world one day, and so he set the boundaries according to the nation, to the tribes of the children of Israel. Um, also go to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel 3, verse 26. Daniel 3, verse 26. And they answered and said, Lo, I see... No, that's at verse 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17. <clears throat> It says, this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. That's Nebuchadnezzar um, giving credit to the God of the three Hebrew children for rescuing them out of the fiery furnace. Uh, look at Daniel 5 verse 18. O thou, king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, and majesty, and glory, and honor. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel 7, verse 25, here, speaking of the Antichrist, he shall speak great words against the most high, and shall wear out the saints of the most high, think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. And boy, I could dwell on that for a little while about one who would think to change times and laws, but we won't, we won't do that today. Uh, devils and unclean spirits seem to know that Jesus Christ is connected with this Most High God. And under the New Testament, to the book of Mark, chapter 5. Mark, chapter 5. Right after Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 5, and um, verse 7. Here the Lord Jesus cast a unclean spirits out of a maniac. They call him the maniac of Gadara, of the Gadarenes, according to verse 1. This guy is running around naked, living in the graveyard, cutting himself with stones and a crazy man. I see people who remind me of him on my way to work, uh, yeah. going through Pomona, P-Town, you know, gangbanger territory. But <clears throat> Mark 5, verse 7, after Christ cast the devil out and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. And Luke chapter 8 Luke chapter 8, same story, just a different account written by Luke. Luke chapter 8, and uh, Luke 8, verse 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou Son of God, Most High, I beseech thee, torment me not. And also Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and then we'll be just about done for today. Acts 16, <clears throat> notice there are verses 16 and 17. It came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, 
which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So from those texts you glean that unclean spirits and devils seem to recognize Jesus in connection with the Most High God of every Gentile nation. As I mentioned, just about every group of, of people in the world believe that there's one supreme God over all. And that, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these days, the Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that, all, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in Philippians chapter 2. Every being, every entity, every unclean spirit, every devil, every world leader, every politician, every man, woman, and child, one day are going to bow their knees to Jesus Christ and confess that He is the Lord God of everything. And the fact that countries, think of, of uh, countries that were Hindu, or countries that are Muslim, they believe in Allah, right? There, um, there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, all of these people who believe in one supreme God over all, other than Jesus Christ, are going to have to confess that Jesus Christ is the one Lord God over all. And all of their deities, all of their gods and goddesses were, were nothing alongside him. Think of Think of any being who was able to create the sun. Think of a being who could just think and speak, and there's the sun in the middle of our solar system. If you think that God is greater than anything you could imagine, if you think that God is all-powerful, and all wise, all knowing, and there's nothing that surprises him. If you give all of these credits to God, let me say this, your thinking is still, still too small. <laughs> that's how big God is. That's how powerful he is. That's how wise he is. That's how intelligent he is. There's not a single thing that ever surprised God. Nothing ever surprised God. God knew everything that everyone would do and at the same time gave them the free will so that they have enough free will they can be held responsible for the things they do. He didn't make them do it. He gave them free will and having perfect knowledge, he knew what they would choose. This is what Calvinists can't figure out. If God knows everything, then God must have caused it to happen. No, God didn't cause it to happen. Listen, if I left a wallet on the sidewalk with, you know, 50 bucks in it, I know that someone's going to walk along, the first person to pick it up and look in, is going to put it in their pocket, hoping no one catches them and walk off. I, I just know that. And you know it too. Because you have a pretty good sense of the nature of people. But when they pick it up, you're not forcing them to steal it. You're not making that decision for them. And so that's just a, a bad way of illustrating it, or a, 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 weak way of illustrating, but think of God in similar terms. God knows what everyone is going to do, but when the action takes place, he didn't make them do it, they did it. And um, your will has to line up with God's will. God wants you to be saved. But do you want to be saved? So your will has to line up with his will so that it can be accomplished. He doesn't force anybody. He doesn't say, you you know, put your arm behind your back. Okay, now get saved. You have, oh, he'll do that to you. You make that decision when the offer is given. The invitation, the gospel is explained to you. You'll either, as we said in our church, you'll either read your Bible or you won't read your Bible. People, ultimately people do what they want to do. You can't, you can give them advice. You can try to steer them in the right direction. Show them scripture, if there's scripture to apply to a situation. But ultimately, people are responsible for what they do, and they're going to be held accountable for what they do, the decisions that they make. So you want to make good decisions. If you messed up yesterday, don't mess up today. If you mess up today, don't mess up tomorrow. 
And um, we'll stop right there and conclude for today. I appreciate your patience with me, and I'm not the best exponent of the scriptures. I don't explain them as clearly as I, as they probably could be, but I pray that you're reading something from week to week. And uh, the book of Hebrews, written to Hebrews, uh, that's why so much, some of it doesn't match the church age and the other letters of Paul to the churches. And that's what we go by. And so the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book, and people have made all kinds of interpretation and doctrinal mistakes, trying to say everything in the book of Hebrews applies to the Christian now. Well, what about the verses where someone loses their salvation? Does that apply to Christians now? Oh, well, no, not that. Well, then make up your mind. <laughs> it can't all apply to all Christians everywhere. I'll give you one instance. John Davis over in England asked me to write an article for his recent newsletter. And uh, so I did and sent it to him, and it was about the importance of dispensations. My grandfather, and I included this story in my article, my grandfather didn't have much education. went through maybe the eighth grade. That's as far as he went. But back in the 19, you know, 20s and 30s, kids dropped out of school to go work, uh, help their parents farm and work and feed themselves during the Depression in the 30s. But he had a lot of common sense. He had a lot of insight and wisdom about life that, that you can't teach in school. And a guy at his church told him, I think all the promises in the Bible are something that every Christian should apply to themselves. And, should claim. And my grandfather says, well, that, that can't be. No, I think all of them. Every promise in the scriptures, every Christian should be able to claim for himself. And my grandfather says, what about the promise that said, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and, and, bear, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. That was a promise to somebody, but it wasn't a promise to you. And the guy didn't have anything to say. Man, I'm telling you, I, I miss him sometimes. It's, they don't make people like that anymore. But not all the promises in the scriptures apply to you. And so the, the importance of dispensational study is to compare scripture with scripture and see where the scriptures match or where the language matches and where the language is different. Maybe the things uh, said to you are different than the things said to somebody else in the past, the Jews in the past. Uh, maybe something in the scriptures doesn't apply to you now, but it will apply to someone in the future, under the tribulation, the Antichrist, and all of that. So rightly dividing the word of truth is the only sensible approach to the Bible. 